Before starting on actually um, describing what's happening in the Sudan and giving a Marxist perspective on the, the, the revolution that's ongoing there, I wanted to give just, just, just a couple of figures about Africa as a whole. It's a continent of 1.3 billion uh, people, uh, but it's the poorest continent in the world. If you consider the fact that the whole of Africa produces a GDP which is about 30% of that of the United States, it gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, some of these countries are among the poorest in the world, uh, with a very low per capita GDP, uh, and yet this is a continent which is potentially rich. It's rich in minerals and other uh, resources. And the reason for this clearly is the imperialist domination uh, going right back to the early days of the European empires that were established, uh, part of which obviously was in Africa. It's in this continent and in this context that we have the events taking place in, um, in the Sudan. The events began back in, in, uh, in December of last year. Um, Bashir, the, the, the president has now been ousted by the revolution, introduced austerity measures um, to stave off what was then considered to be imminent uh, economic collapse. Um, and in the classic uh, way we see in many African countries, um, he introduced cuts to subsidies on bread and fuel, basic necessities of ordinary working people and poor in a country like the Sudan. Um, this time it sparked off demonstrations uh, and then the protest movement from being about the immediate economic questions developed into a, a political movement, um, the aim of which was uh, to remove the hated uh, dictator. And in April, this movement climaxed after months of protests in demonstrators occupying the square in front of the military headquarters, um, demanding the military step in and remove the dictator, which is what uh, happened a few days later. Um, and a council of generals took over in April, uh, has become known as the uh, transitional, transitional uh, military uh, council. Uh, everybody has seen the scenes that, were, uh, that went viral internationally of uh, the protesters, particularly the women. This is a country where women are particularly oppressed, but uh, you saw the, the famous young woman leading the singing um, in an atmosphere of joy and jubilation that uh, the people were finally uh, being heard and the dictator was being removed. Now, uh, the people who stepped in um, thought they could step in and maneuver cleverly and put an end to this protest. But um, what is actually driving this revolution? Why is it proving to be so resilient? Well, just some figures here, which I, I, I put in one of my recent articles. High levels of unemployment, uh, officially standing at about 20%. Nearly half the population, 45%, lives below the poverty line. Inflation has shot up, standing at over 30%. Public debt has ballooned. External debt has grown. Um, just one figure, a third of Sudanese children considered to be overweight. Uh, shortages of bread, petrol, diesel, cash, um, the collapse of the currency and the inflation that came with it. These are all consequences of the crisis of capitalism, not just in Sudan, it's a worldwide crisis, but it's impacting countries like Sudan, who are um, suffering particularly because of the um, low level of development of the economy there and the already existing high levels of uh, poverty. Um, this is what's driving this revolution. And it's not just Sudan, of course. Before I continue with, with, uh, with, with the Sudan, we have the ongoing situation in Liberia. We have the movement in Algeria. And if you look at Africa over the last six, seven years, we've seen a whole number of movements. Usually it's sparked off by the sitting dictator or president or premier that refuses to go. And when the people think uh, the time has come for him to go and he refuses to stand down, 
we've seen movement after movement after movement uh, across Africa. Africa, in, in effect, is, is, is boiling. It's, uh, it's on the move. Um, but what the revolution in Sudan is showing is all the classical elements of a revolutionary or pre-revolutionary situation. You have a deep underlying economic crisis. The masses which have lost the fear of the old regime come out uh, in big numbers, so big, so powerful, that the uh, dictatorship is, to is, uh, is toppled. And then begins a period of manoeuvring. The people at the top, the people behind the old regime, attempting to hold on to power. Um, the old saying, changing everything so nothing changes, i.e. cosmetic changes, to try and um, please the masses and appease them, get them back uh, to, what, to normality, i.e. to living in normal conditions, no protests, no strikes, etc., and hope that they can survive this uh, turmoil. But uh, the Sudanese revolution, as I said, is proving to be very resilient. Um, the, uh, it began uh, with the protests, as I, as I said earlier on, which led to the overthrow of the old dictator. Um, but the opposition was in negotiations with the Transitional Military Council, and they were discussing the terms of the period of transition, uh, what should happen at the end, and how the government should be composed. And they were negotiating uh, a proposal, which was that two-thirds of the future representatives would be elected, and one-third would be in the hands of the council, which means basically giving uh, um, uh, large weight to the military in any future uh, power setup, which means obviously um, the military will be there guaranteeing that the old system survives, even if in a democratic form. Then there was the general strike, one week before the, uh, the, the, the brutal clampdown that we saw last week. That general strike was a key moment in the development of the revolution because um, it, it went very far. Actually, if, if we compare it to many other movements across Africa, it's, Sudan has shown to be one of the most advanced in terms of the methods used by the masses. The call for a general strike was, was received uh, enthusiastically. Uh, airports closed, ports closed, uh, shops closed, ministries closed. Um, a massive general strike that lasted for some time. That um, kind of general strike it poses the question of power. It poses the question, who should run the country? A general strike like that is not just a strike about this or that wage increase. When that number of people uh, moves so, on such a massive scale, it does pose the question, the working people, the workers, the peasants, etc., the youth, could take power. They have the, uh, the force to do it. But what we see in, in, uh, in the Sudan today is that although there is a leadership, uh, the opposition clearly has a leadership, that leadership didn't really know what to do with the general strike. Uh, it had been very powerful, very successful, and then it was called off. Um, such a situation uh, doesn't allow uh, much room for maneuver. At a certain point, the people within the regime uh, saw the immense power of the working people of Sudan and decided it was time to crush the movement. They stepped in with the, uh, the militias that uh, uh, broke up the, uh, um, the sit-in, leading to the killing of, according to the reports, over 100 people. Bodies were found in the, in the Nile. Um, a brutal clampdown. They felt, we've got to crush this revolution because it's going too far. Uh, I think they miscalculated because um, when a revolution is on the rise and powerful and the masses are conscious of their own strength and uh, have confidence in their own power, moving in that kind of direction, instead of having the um, achieving what the reactionary elements wanted can actually achieve the opposite. It's like, the, as Marx said, the whip of the counter-revolution sometimes is necessary to spur on the revolution. And that is what it did. Um, the call for um, a general strike as a reaction to that clampdown, um, again, 
was uh, uh, was very successful. The, all the reports show that um, you know empty streets, the airports closed, uh, planes not taking off, etc. Um, a powerful response by um, um, the working people of Sudan, and yet once again, after showing an enormous uh, uh, spirit of, uh, of militancy and determination. The leaders of the opposition called the strike off again. Uh, while this was happening, we have reports of the militias carrying out massacres in villages, burning people's houses. Um, in, um, uh, in one area in central Darfur, there were reports of the Janjaweed militias uh, killing people and burning their houses. Um, so you have the two, the two elements of the revolution and counter-revolution both together. The mass is moving and reaction trying to uh, clamp down. Um, it, it's funny to see one of uh, the contradictory statements. Uh, one of the, the spokesmen of the, um, uh, the TMC, the Transitional Military Council, Kabashi, in the same speech, in the same paragraph almost, he said um, that civil disobedience, i.e. the general strike, uh, had not affected everyday life. And then the next sentence was he called on the opposition to put an end to the civil disobedience because it was affecting everyday life. Um, the strike was clearly a success. He then claimed that what happened um, the week before with the violence and, and the killings um, was due to mistakes in implementation by the security forces. This is an insult to the people of Sudan. Now, what, what, is, what, where, what is happening? Where are we going uh, from here? Because the opposition twice now have shown the power of the general strike and the immense potential for a movement of the masses. And yet, uh, twice after having mobilized, they've stepped back. You can't keep mobilizing the masses forever in such a way. At a certain point, a vacuum appears. Um, the masses are not going on strike for the sake of it. They are going on strike because they want the change which they've been struggling for for months now. They want an end uh, to this situation and they want an end to the terrible economic and social suffering that's taking place. The unemployment, the poverty, the hunger, um, the violence. That's what they want uh, to put an end to. Um, and it's not coming. The crisis of capitalism is not going away. So what we have is now the elements within the ruling elite in, um, in Sudan are divided over what to do. One section came out uh, for repression. That didn't work. Uh, so clearly they're swinging back to the idea of reopening negotiations. The prime minister of Ethiopia rushed to, um, to the Sudan to mediate and try and get uh, people round the table again to discuss. Um, the latest is that uh, Trump has also woken up to the fact that something should be done about the Sudan has, has nominated an ambassador and the whole aim of imperialism is clearly some kind of transition to some kind of stable democratic regime as they, as they see it. Um, basically, how do you get from a brutal dictatorship that defends the interests of capitalism to a stable bourgeois democratic regime which defends the interests of capitalism, hoping to avoid too, too much turmoil and too much um, class struggle and the potential for the overthrow of capitalism itself, which is what they're terrified of. What kind of maneuvers do we have? Well, we have within the opposition itself elements who are prepared to compromise. For example, the Umma party. Um, here we can see that some of them are thinking clearly along the lines of the Egyptian model, i.e. Um, bring on the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Ummah Party is similar to that, a kind of semi-legal opposition under the previous regime, trying to use its uh, credentials as having been uh, a partial opposition um, to try and uh, fill the vacuum that's appearing, Playing, playing uh, the game of oppositionists who will then become much more reasonable and are prepared to negotiate with the uh, government. Um, that's one um, idea which is clearly uh, there. Um, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia uh, said that uh, the, uh, the, the negotiations would open again, 
Um, and he announced that um, the opposition was prepared to uh, reopen negotiations. Um, and one of the demands was that the, the Transition Military Council should assume responsibility for the violence that took place on June the 3rd. And they pose other conditions. They're demanding an international investigation, the release of political prisoners, um, public freedoms, uh, freedom of the press, to lift the ban on uh, the internet because they blocked the internet, and to take the military off the streets. And if this is granted, then they will return to negotiate. This, is, this means uh, maintaining the line of peaceful, peaceful protest um, and hoping that they can negotiate some kind of transition to some kind of uh, democratic uh, setup in the Sudan. It means negotiating with the very same people who were responsible for what happened um, on June the 3rd. This, is, this shows the limits of leadership in, um, in Sudan. Some of these people are courageous and are to be commended for the uh, role they've played, and they've taken the revolution up to a point. But it's very clear now that the opposition doesn't have a clear idea of where to take the revolution from here. Um, all the advisors are there advising them to keep it peaceful, to negotiate, to avoid um, uh, a collapse of the system, um, etc. Um, the, uh, the concluding remarks that we can make as Marxists is this. There was one powerful general strike. There was a brutal clampdown followed by another powerful general strike. As I said before, you can't keep mobilizing at this level um, without the prospect of actually achieving something soon. The masses cannot be mobilized forever. Um, there must be an indication that this is going to lead to some real change. And in, in revolutions and counter-revolutions, they have, there's a logic and there are laws to these processes. Um, both of them need to move forward if they are to keep moving. Um, once you stop and take a step back, you risk losing the power of the mobilization. And the, what we have here is the counter-revolution and its leaders are very conscious of the, what's going on. They have a clear class consciousness. It's the consciousness of the ruling elite. The revolution, on the other hand, doesn't have the clear consciousness of where it's going. It's looking for a leadership, um, which um, unfortunately is lacking. What should be done? We have resistance committees all around uh, the Sudan. We've had the powerful general strikes. What they should have done is elect delegates from all the local resistance committees to a central resistance committee under the leadership uh, of the opposition, um, declare the general strike, but don't stop and pull it back to open negotiations declare that committee the government of the country and most importantly make a conscious appeal to the rank and file soldiers because we have here the militias we have the security forces but we also have an interesting element which is the reaction of ordinary rank and file soldiers when that killing was taking place we have reports of some instances where soldiers defended people from the attacks of the militias but they're very partial, very limited. Soldiers are prepared to revolt and side with the revolution if they see a revolution which is prepared to go the whole way. If it stops halfway and retreats and leaves in power the structures which are there now, soldiers who rebel risk being court-martialed, arrested and punished. Therefore, to, to bring out the potential of that revolt, it requires determination on the part of the revolution. If that call were issued, then you'd have the forces with which to stop the reactionary militias uh, from, uh, from acting. You'd have the force to defend the revolution. If that's not done, we can have a period of negotiation we can have a period in an attempt to establish a bourgeois democratic uh, regime in the Sudan. There is another side to it, of course. The ethnic divisions which exist in the country can be exploited to push the country into another direction, which is barbarism. We saw it in Syria, we saw it in Libya, and we've seen it in other countries. They are prepared to unleash the worst 
uh, barbarism you can imagine if that is what they need to destroy the revolution. To stop that from becoming a possible concrete perspective, the revolution must go forward and they must take power. If they don't, the initiative will be taken by somebody else. And we should learn from what happened in Egypt and in other countries how the other side maneuvers. The revolution must learn from this and draw all the necessary conclusions.